Could a hypercane end all life on Earth? Wait, what's a hypercane? Well, a hypercane is like a hurricane on steroids. With wind speeds of over 800 kilometers per hour and a duration of several weeks, a hypercane could be large enough to cover the whole of North America, while also reaching 40 kilometers high into the Earth's upper stratosphere. It's pretty safe to say this will cause global devastation, and it was first proposed by Professor Kerry Emanuel. Well, hyper, of course, means something that's uh, fantastically out of bounds, and the cane comes from hurricane. So a hypercane is an extreme tropical cyclone that forms if the sea surface temperature rises above 50 degrees. And it's terrifyingly huge. Professor Emanuel believes it may actually have happened once before, potentially having contributed to the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. But before we get too carried away, luckily for us, hypercanes are just theoretical, at least for now. Well, I uh, coined that term back in the 1980s when I was working on a theory uh, that governs the maximum intensity, the maximum wind speed you can have in a hurricane. But there was an anomaly that just kept coming up. If you tried to push the temperature of the ocean too high, you couldn't solve the equations. They didn't have a solution. And it was very puzzling to me. So Professor Emanuel had to come up with an entirely new theory, the hypercane. Well, hypercanes would form if uh, the ocean temperature became extraordinarily large, particularly if it did so in a small region a few hundred kilometers across. By large, I mean in excess of 50 degrees uh, centigrade. The reason the temperature matters so much is because hurricanes form above warm oceans, when hot air rises and cold air comes rushing in to replace it, creating a spiraling and growing storm cloud. The hotter the seas, the greater the cloud. Okay, so the largest recorded tropical storm is Typhoon Tip, a typhoon that emerged in 1979 and affected multiple countries. The storm reached peak sustained wind speeds of 305 km per hour, with a wind diameter of 2,220 km. That's big enough to cover around half of the United States. Oh, quickly since we're here. If you're wondering what the difference is between hurricanes, typhoons and cyclones, it turns out Nothing, at least nothing scientifically. All three words describe the same weather system, a tropical storm, and the difference is as simple as which part of the world the storms form over. Back to the hypercane. Will we see another one of them anytime soon? Well, there's no doubt sea temperatures are rising and making hurricanes more powerful. Well, so in today's climate, um, hurricane wind speeds at the surface can get up to maybe close to 90 meters per second. And we expect that to go up as we continue to warm the climate. And in fact, we're beginning to see evidence in observations that it is going up. So maybe we'll have a 95 meter per second hurricane or 100 meters per second. And because the destructive potential of, of wind storms goes up very quickly with wind, at least as the cube of the wind, that three or four meters per second is actually a lot, uh, makes the storm potentially a lot more damaging. So this is something to watch. If ocean temperatures did continue to rise above 50 degrees C, there's no doubt hypercanes would cause devastation on the ground. But higher up, there'd be a potentially even more damaging consequence. Because a hypercane would reach so high that it would actually interact with the ozone layer. And one of the things that interested us about the computer models of the hypercane is hypercanes are pumping up all kinds of material into the middle stratosphere, like water vapor, that really don't belong there. Uh, would, through a series of chemical reactions, lead to the destruction of ozone, which would endanger life on the surface. And we pose that as a potential link between bolide impacts and mass extinctions that are thought to have gone along with them. Hypercanes uh, could be an explanation for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Without the ozone layer's protection and with continuing or even multiplying storms, life would struggle to survive on the surface. It really could lead to the end of life on Earth as we know it. So here's the big question. How likely is all this? It's impossible to have missed the fact that global sea temperatures are rising. But luckily, we are a long way from 50 degrees sea temperatures and any resulting hypercanes at the moment. The Indian Ocean is the warmest, and even that only has a sea surface temperature of around 30 degrees C in places. I think it's time for some good news. 
in today's climate, the warmest ocean temperatures we see in the tropics, we expect that they will continue to go up maybe to 32 or 33 degrees, but not to 50 degrees. In fact, we don't think that's really happened even in the Earth's past. It's not something that will happen as a result of natural or even man-made climate change. It's not something to worry about. So without any asteroid-induced, world-changing events, we're unlikely to ever see a hypercane, as fascinating as the name and theory may be. But perhaps the dinosaurs weren't so lucky. There's an ambitious plan to stop hurricanes in their tracks, using bubbles. You think you, you must be crazy? Yep, bubbles. And tests are already underway. Here's why we might need it. Hurricanes are getting stronger. Scientists say that rising sea temperatures are fueling hurricanes and making them increasingly fierce. This was Hurricane Katrina in 2005. In just one day, it was responsible for 40% of all hurricane-related deaths in a 50-year period. And since then, nine major hurricanes have made landfall in the United States alone. Modeling also suggests that there may be a 20% increase in major hurricanes globally by the end of the century. Given the scale of the problem, you'd think it might be impossible to solve it, but there's a scientist in Norway who's helped develop a technology using bubbles that might just be the key. It seems like an out there idea, but when it comes to the world of geoengineering, nothing has been off the cards. Scientists have been trying to engineer their way out of a hurricane since at least the 1960s. Project Storm Fury, a joint effort of NOAA, the Navy and the Air Force. In Project Storm Fury, scientists thought that they could artificially create a new eye wall, which could clash with the original one and weaken the storm. That unfortunately failed. More recently, scientists suggested spraying fine seawater droplets into the sky to reflect away the sun's rays and thus cool the sea. This is still being explored, but it's at very early stages. Other gems proposed include towing icebergs to cool down warmer seas, purposely making oil slicks on the sea surface to prevent evaporation, and anti-hurricane jet engines on barges that would literally suck the heat from the ocean. Obviously. Some have even suggested that shockwaves from a nuke could disrupt the hurricane and weaken its process. Thankfully, that one's not being seriously considered. But let's get back to the bubble idea. And yet, yeah, I know what you're thinking, how on earth could bubbles possibly stop a 100 mile an hour hurricane? But the interesting thing about this plan is it's already been through various trials and simulations, and there are actually plans to start trialing this in the real world. So I tracked down scientist Grim Eidness, who first developed the idea at Sintef, a Norwegian research agency. Having been inspired by traditional Norwegian technique of using bubbles to prevent fjords from freezing over. A bubble curtain is a perforated tube that is uh, submerged into the sea, into the ocean. The bubble curtain in Moirana, for instance, uh, is keeping the area of, around the bubble curtains free of, of ice. The way we do this in Norway is to lift up the lower layer of uh, warmer water up to the surface, where it mixes with the cold water and thus changes the temperature of the surface water. Grimm wants to flip this idea around and take it to the tropics, using it against hurricanes, where water from the depths is colder and therefore can be used to cool the surface temperature. To understand their plan, we're first going to need a crash course as to how hurricanes actually form, because sea surface temperature plays a massive role. So a hurricane is born as a pretty innocuous tropical storm. But when that storm passes over warmer seas, typically that means temperatures above 26.5, then this warmth fuels and feeds the storm, intensifying it into a full-blown hurricane. It does this because large volumes of evaporated water from the sea surface rise to form huge storm clouds, which are often rotated by very strong winds. And if those wind speeds exceed 74 miles per hour, boom, you've got yourself a hurricane. 26.5, you cut off the energy supply. If it's 30.5 or 32 degrees Celsius, then a lot of energy could be transported up to the hurricane. So 26.5 degrees, that's the sweet spot. Below this temperature, there's no net feeding of the hurricane, stopping it from coming more ferocious. That's why sea surface temperature is at the heart of the bubble plan, by pumping up colder water from the depth to the top and therefore lowering the temperature. But if pumping up water is all that's needed, why can't they just use pipes? That has been suggested by several people. Cold water is heavier than warm water. It would be too heavy and sink down again. So bubble curtains act like a blender, creating this mixed layer and keeping the water cool. 
with the ocean currents also helping to spread this effect to larger areas. Sounds handy, especially since hurricanes can span hundreds of miles. Depriving hurricanes of its food source using this cold water blanket is an ingenious plan, but is there any proof it actually works? We have performed a proof of concept with the real weather and the real temperatures. This computer model shows how cooler water caused by the bubble curtain spreads using natural currents. This simulation showed that in 40 hours, the cooler water spread over 60 kilometers. So, they've shown in theory that this bubble curtain can affect the temperature of a large area of the ocean surface. The next stage is to run a larger simulation on historical hurricanes. But what about trying it out in the real world? All the tests you have in Norway are very shallow water models. And in, when we talk to the Gulf of Mexico, we talk about 50 meters, maybe 100 and even 150 meters depth. That's why we went to one weekend to try to have at least 50 meters of, uh, of uh, test. Once these trials are complete, the end game for Grimm's plan is to have a series of bubble curtains towed along by tugboats. But for all that to work in real world context, there's still one massive hurdle they'd need to overcome. They'd need to rapidly deploy the boats to the right place at the right time. And in order to do that, they need to know exactly where and when the hurricane is going to form. So I took a trip to the National Center for Atmospheric Science to meet a meteorologist and climate risk expert, Dr. Liz Stevens, to find out just how difficult it is to prevent a hurricane. We're very good at being able to forecast the track of hurricanes further in advance, but sometimes we miss the exact intensity that those storms will be. Modern day computer models struggle to capture this intensity. We just don't have enough information on the small physical events happening within the center of the hurricane. In the US, Pilots actually fly into the center of the storm to gather this crucial data directly. We've seen tropical cyclones in recent years that have rapidly intensified even less than 12 hours before they've made landfall. And this hasn't been something that's been well forecasted. Even with all the cutting edge satellites and weather models, it's still very tough to predict hurricanes in advance. So for some people, defense rather than attack is still our best bet when it comes to dealing with hurricanes. The best way to reduce the impacts of tropical cyclones and hurricanes is to ensure that we are building houses and infrastructure to withstand them. And that means building them with stronger roofs so that we're really reducing the impacts. Actual physical barriers like flood walls can be a game changer when it comes to things like storm surges, where the strong winds cause the sea to rise, which is often the leading cause of death from hurricanes. The Thames Barrier, for example, shields London from storm surges and flooding, but in areas of the world unable to afford them, natural barriers like mangroves and wetlands can be really effective in protecting coastlines. There's another big concern about geoengineering though. Geoengineering might do well at reducing temperatures and reducing the risk of heat waves, for example. In other parts of the world, it could end up perhaps restricting rainfall, which could lead to more droughts. This seems to be the general consensus among many scientists skeptical of geoengineering. Whether it's droughts or affecting marine ecosystems, how do we avoid an even bigger problem from the knock-on effects of meddling with nature? It's a crucial area that the Bobble Plan doesn't seem to be addressing just yet. There are things with respect to, to climate, with respect to ecology, that we want others to look into. And we have started this uh, to find out the best uh, companies to do this work for us. If further trials and simulations are successful, the final gear in Grimm's plan is a full-scale demonstration in the Gulf of Mexico, a hotspot for hurricanes. If you have some good warnings that it comes to this location, the track will be there and there, get some vessels going there immediately and they can do it now. So as long as the, 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 the forecast of the, the trajectory of the hurricanes is good enough, uh, we, can, we can act on them also. Clearly the jury is definitely still out, but unlike most geoengineering ideas, this one's actually going ahead. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming years. If the bubble curtain showed to have a real impact on the hurricanes, I think I would uh, be glad and I would certainly smile and I would feel relief. Until then, it doesn't seem like a bad idea to take Liz's advice that defense can really be the best form of attack when dealing with hurricanes. By beefing up natural barriers, bolstering storm defenses, and improving early warning systems, and critically, preventing further sea temperature rise by addressing climate change.